Hello. Janice, thank you so much for joining me today and talking with me about the article you wrote, Diabetes in the Bedroom. I'm so excited to learn more about it. But first, can you tell me, tell us all, you know, what what is your background? What What is your line of work? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Kate, for inviting me. And I say hello to your entire audience. So uh, it's very really exciting to be here. My background uh, is kind of lengthy. I started out as a registered dietitian who became a certified diabetes educator. And I started to specialize in diabetes, obviously. Got very interested in the relationship piece on diabetes because nothing was written for that population at all. As a matter of fact, what motivated me is I was doing a nutrition consultation with a, with a patient. And uh, after I was finished with this gentleman, I walked out into the waiting room and saw this woman weeping in the corner by herself. And I sat down next to her to see if I could help her. It turned out that she was his wife. Mm. And she said, I, I've had it. I can't take it anymore. His diabetes is just overwhelming our relationship, overwhelming everything. And I had absolutely nothing to give to her. Not, not, a, not a handout, not a book title, nothing. So at that point I decided I needed to break out the nutrition end, spread out, started doing a lot of writing about relationships, uh -huh. which led me then to um, also become an urgent family therapist. That's amazing. And, yeah, and I get, I'll throw it in since I'm wearing my hat. I'm, I was, uh, I'm also, from 2009, I was Diabetes Educator of the Year. Oh my gosh, congrats. Yeah, thank you. Wow. The American Association of Diabetes Educators. So. That, that is a good recommendation. But, uh, no, but I've done a lot, but I've been really focused on how diabetes affects relationships, how it affects the bedroom, sexuality, and very few people in our field speak about it. My co-author and I write together. We're still the go-to people after all these years. Our first book was in 2006, and we're still the people. So what's, what's the title of your first book? Because I'm only aware of the, the new one. Well, the first book is called Sex and Diabetes. OK. And what we did is we took that, updated it so significantly that we retitled it and so that's the book that uh that you're familiar with now intimacy and diabetes so that's really the updated one so so thank you i mean you when i saw that you were writing this book and uh, it really realized it made me realize that there is absolutely a chasm in the field for information about how diabetes can impact people's sexuality and i wonder you know, in all of the, the research that you've been doing and writing these two books and working on this blog and all of your clinical practice, what are you seeing to be some of the biggest, um, I guess, cross-sections of diabetes and, and intimacy? Well, first of all, I think the lack of information uh, is huge because as you know, there's very little written, so we have sex therapists and couples who don't realize that diabetes could impact what's going on in their sexual relationship. So that's, that affects it. The other thing is that um, we've got levels, we have communication, we have, when there is a chronic illness like diabetes, there's a tendency for the partner to become a parental figure where, you know, don't do that, your doctor said you shouldn't, and did you do this, and how come you didn't do that? That's and, right, and how do you take that into the bedroom? It's almost like having sex with a parent at that point. Yeah. And it really is very challenging on the relationship. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And in addition to that, as I said, the energy level shifts. If, you, if your blood glucose level, your blood sugar level isn't in the appropriate range for you, it's really hard to get your energy level up. It's hard to feel good, it's hard to feel sexy. It's, uh, it's a problem if you also feel damaged, and that's one thing about having any chronic illness. But with diabetes, especially if people check their fingers so they might be pricking, you sometimes get black and blue marks if you're doing injections. 
if you're wearing a monitor, there's adhesive marks and bruises. And so in terms of feeling good about your body and and having an interest in having someone see you, that's a piece also. So there's a lot going on. Uh, if you don't feel that your partner's been supportive, that goes into the country. Um, just a, a lot of stuff. There's also a financial piece. Mm. Having diabetes is not cheap. <laughs> you, you may want to buy certain foods. You may um, have certain medication needs. Testing equipment uh, that can bring the pressure that also enters the bedroom where one partner is resentful that the patient money is not being spent a lot on, on medical issues. So a lot of that goes in. That's such a good point. I mean, it's when you have all of these additional expenses to factor in, sometimes that can take away from people's ability to feel liberated from their work and like they can let their hair down and be more playful or spontaneous. If they have all of these expenses that they know are in addition to the daily things like paying your mortgage, your rent, insurance and whatnot, that's, yeah, I can see how that would be a real albatross for people. Definitely. And also, if you do schedule sex, which a lot of couples have to do because of their lives, what if you're the one with diabetes and at that moment you don't feel as interested as you hoped you would? Because you may have just recently had a, a blood sugar swing that left you feeling uh, not yourself. Um, so it, it really is literally a third person in the relationship. It's somebody else in the bedroom with you, without a doubt. So how do you navigate that with couples? What are some things that you advise them to do so that they can talk about it and really honor each person's needs and their limits and their frustrations as well as their arousals and desires? I mean, it seems like there are a lot of layers to the conversation that couples have. Definitely. I'm a, I consider myself a narrative therapist. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, but that's my perspective. And one thing we do in the narrative world is we like to, what we call externalize issues, which means realize that it's not you, it's the issue. You're not the problem, the problem is the problem. So what I've done, there's one couple, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate it with this one couple I met with. They have diabetes they both in their bedroom. Only one, one member had diabetes. And in... The wife is always blaming the husband. He was the one with diabetes. He started having erection problems because that's one of the possible issues with uh, a, a less than optimal blood sugar and, you know, control. So, uh, hate to use the word control. We'll just say condition. Okay. So what we did is I asked them to take the diabetes and see it as another person and name it. Okay. And what they did, this is a while ago, if you remember when Prince Charles was married to Princess Diana, uh, the third person in their marriage was Camilla Parker Bowles. So they named diabetes Camilla. Oh, so suddenly, when the husband either was unable to get a satisfactory erection, instead of feeling uh, that he had done something wrong or having his, it was a wife, they were married, having his wife say, well, you don't love me as much or I didn't turn you on as much or whatever. They both turned to Camilla and said, Camilla, what the heck are you doing in our bedroom? <laughs> so the blame went elsewhere, actually where it really did belong on diabetes. Camilla, if you're going to come in our bedroom, would you stop messing around? It became a humorous exchange. They started to interact um, with a lot more humor and love. He wasn't able to get the erection he wanted, but they started to be playful in different ways and explore different, um, you know, got about with different oral sex positions and, and massage and all that because Camilla wasn't cooperating. Yeah. So removing the blame from each other was just so healing for them. That is such a beautiful example. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I just love the, the idea of rem reminding a couple and helping them remind each other that they are on the same side. 
of any kind of difficulty that might impede on their ability to feel connected physically, emotionally, or sexually. And this is one of the things that I struggle with, or I should say that the couples I work with struggle with the most is remembering that they're aligned on the same side of the, the problem. So I love that. Oh. Do, giving them an opportunity to like put it out there and make it this other persona because yeah. it's part of, it's not born out of any one of them independently. No, and it, and it works so well for them. The other thing to remember is that there are treatments that are effective. There are a lot of treatments for men with diabetes, so they can regain a satisfactory erection, or if there's so much damage to the blood vessels because of ca uh, cardiovascular heart issues that are have been maybe ongoing for years, there he could use a penile sleeve, which is more of a solid type of tube-like piece that he could put on a flaccid on a non-erect penis, mm -hmm. put a condom over it, and still have intercourse. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to be erect for that. So there, there are options that the couple can use. Um, one thing that's important to know is that men, and we'll get to women's issues, women also could have issues from diabetes, but um, a lot of men rely on oral medications, you know, the Levitra, Cialis, Stendra, all those. They only work in about 60% of men with diabetes. So it's important to know that, that it's not necessarily your fault. And if it doesn't work, if you don't get the erection you're hoping for, that doesn't mean that you're done. There's a lot of other options. And then that would be similar to the options that you might suggest to your audience when it comes to vacuum pumps and implants and the whole, you know, catalog, which is available to all men. But one thing that I really do want to highlight Men with diabetes have a very special relationship with their blood sugar level. Men who can help keep their blood sugar level in the healthy range that their healthcare team recommends for them, they're more likely to reduce their sexual complications or get rid of them. So we see that men who all of a sudden start taking better care of their diabetes, they're sexual issues improve dramatically so it's a you know good advertisement take care of yourself that sounds so empowering because one of the things that i, I hear most is how helpless people feel when they're experiencing some of these difficulties in their mm -hmm. second relationships and you know when people feel helpless it can really compound their confidence and their ability to sort of feel like they have opportunities to course correct so knowing that things like changing their diet being more cognizant of their blood sugar proactively can really start to impact their sexual satisfaction and prowess. This feels like a step toward I'm in control again, which is really- but You know, that's, that's one reason why I really liked going into the diabetes world. Because if you look at all of the other chronic illnesses in the world, uh, let's take cancer, for example. You can try many, many things, but may not achieve any type of an improvement. It's kind of hope, pray, try this, try that. But with diabetes, if you walk an extra 15 minutes a day, you will see an improvement in your blood sugar. So there's a lot that is empowering. And if you change how you eat or make a different decision or lower your stress, it's the, the person who has it has so much power to improve. And that's what I love. And it trickles over into the bedroom as well. Well, you've mentioned some of the complications that men experience with diabetes in terms of intimacy. Are there any that you haven't mentioned that you want to say before we talk about women? Um, well, for men, um, what I would say is, first of all, it's important to recognize that you may have to reframe intimacy. Your erection, especially if you use a vacuum pump or something like that, you know, may not be what you were when you were a teenager. Um, uh, so let's see, we talked about erections with men, sometimes libido can be an issue, and that often happens if your blood sugar level is low or swinging, you don't feel yourself, your energy level. Um, there is something called retrograde ejaculation, which we see in some men with diabetes. That's when they actually ejaculate 
feels like an ejaculation. You certainly have an orgasm, but nothing comes out because it's actually been redirected and it'll come out later with the urine. It gets kind of redirected. That we see sometimes when there's certain nerve damage. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything from men. There's a lot of issues related to being overweight um, in terms of being able to physically move around the bedroom. Uh, but basically that's it. It's really the erection is the, huge, the biggest piece for men. For women, women now, it's a different story. Unfortunately, we don't have the same level of research that with women that we have with men. It's harder to get women to want to be willing to um, participate, electrodes put onto their vulva and have things monitored. With a man, you can always tell, certainly visually, when he's becoming aroused. The woman's a little harder. Uh, also, a lot of women aren't as aware of their body and their reactions. But what we have with women is we sometimes have pain that is related to having diabetes, more likely to have pain during intercourse, more likely to have dryness, vaginal dryness. So the whole lubrication issue can become a problem uh, because high blood sugar sometimes dehydrates the body. That's one possible reason. Also, nerve communication can be affected. But the main thing we see with women is that um, depression is a huge piece. Diabetes and depression are very linked, and a woman's emotions can really affect her ability to connect, her libido, her ability to relax, her ability to have her body respond. And of course, as you probably mentioned your audience, once you have a negative experience as a woman, your body's more likely to kind of freeze up in anticipation that it may hurt again. So we have all that. And then the communication piece, which is with all couples. Can you say what you need? Can you, uh, oh, one thing also that I, sorry, I'm kind of scattered here. Another thing for women is that women with diabetes tend to need more time to become physically aroused. So you may need to explain to your partner that you need more time to um, engage in uh, any type of physical massage, uh, emotional connecting, romance. Uh, it may take you longer. And also you may want to use uh, lubricant and, and other things. But to know that it may take you longer and that you're not to blame, Camilla is. So that's you know, another piece.